Hello, my name is Paul Riley. I'm from the scientific marketing team at Diagnostic Estago, and we are doing a third of these Stago scientific short series on lupus anticoagulant testing and the different component tests that can be run as part of that panel. And we did this in order to illuminate the different tests and the different methodologies and the rationale for how those methodologies work. And our guest here today is Claudia. Please introduce yourself, Claudia. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me today. Uh, my name is Claudia Escobar. I am the lead applications and new technologies trainer here at Diagnostic Stago. Um, I am a laboratorian. I worked in special coagulation laboratories I, and I have performed uh, my fair share of lupus anticoagulant testing. And so I'm happy to join you here today, Paul. Great, great. Um, could you explain the dilute Russell Viper Venom time test and its place in the lupus anticoagulant screening and diagnostic pathway? You know, keeping in mind that we've already talked about some other parts of the lupus anticoagulant pathway. So that's why we're just jumping right into this test. Of course. Um, so DRVD or dilute Russell's Viper Venom, as you mentioned, is another one of those components of the lupus panel. Because every lupus antibody behaves differently, no single test is 100% sensitive or specific for lupus anticoagulant. So in the previous session, as you mentioned, we discussed other methods such as the APTT. The DRVV is uh, an assay based on a dilute reagent from the venom of the Russell's Viper. And as opposed to the APTT, which is involved with the intrinsic pathway, the DRVV initiates coagulation directly at factor 10 or the mm -hmm. common pathway so okay. that we see a direct impact at that point. And as I mentioned with the APTT previously here, now what we're looking at also is really how much lupus antibody is present in a patient sample and what is the impact going to be on that result on that clotting time for that particular assay. And just as with the PTT, we have a screen and confirmatory step. We also have the same methodology for the DRVV assay. Mm -hmm. We always want to first screen with a low phospholipid reagent to really see the enhancement of that clotting time or prolongation, mm -hmm. follow it up then with the confirmatory step as a, as a second um, or complementary part of the panel. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And it's good that there's these different assays to to make sure that we get this diagnosis right. Um, so what is the difference in the DRVVT screening assay versus the confirmatory assay then? So here again, it's a game of phospholipid content because we mm -hmm. really want to, one, in the screening assays, and in this case, the DRVV, we want to keep that phospholipid content low, really giving the the antibody, the LA antibody, that opportunity to really show itself and really mm -hmm. demonstrate that prolongation in the clotting time. And then mm -hmm. on the flip side, once we know that that's, that test is prolonged and we are suspecting the presence of a lupus anticoagulant, um, after we've done the mixing study and the mixing study is still prolonged, then moving on to the to the confirmatory, we're looking at really high phospholipid concentrations here. And even just okay. physically looking at the reagents, you see the different aspect between a screen, which is very clear, and a confirmatory reagent, which is cloudy because of that mm -hmm. phospholipid product in there. And so there now we're expecting in the presence of a lupus anticoagulant that that confirmatory step we are really wanting to overwhelm that antibody and shorten mm -hmm. that clotting time as comparison. Okay, great. So how does the DRVVT assay get validated initially at the time of implementing the test in the laboratory and as well as at lot changes? So it's a similar process to your APTT-based assay, um, lupus sure. anticoagulant assays, or really, again, any assay in the coagulation laboratory, you're going to have precisions that you're going to do to, you know, look at reproducibility. You're going to have another precision uh, exercise that helps you establish quality control. You're going to have your reference ranges that you're going to establish, which are a little bit different for DRBV than what is normally uh, performed in the laboratory. And then finally, you want to make sure 
that the results that you are reporting from your analyzer are reproducible and compared to a reference method, be it a method you already run on, a, let's say, a Stago instrument with a Stago DRVV reagent mm -hmm. or a, a, a site located somewhere else that is also running the assay that you are trying to validate. And of course, at lock conversion, it becomes the same process. You mm -hmm. want to make sure that in comparing a new uh, current lot to a new lot, that you are retrieving the same results. And if there's any ne necessity to tweak the reference range, that you do that at that time with a set of normals. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so, how does the DRVVT assay get reported after these tests are performed? Right, like what kinds of calculations are done and what are the benefits of those calculations and the final reporting of these assays? Yeah, the DRVV test is reported in a little bit more complex calculation than you see with other lupus anticoagulant tests like the state cloud LA, for example, which is just a delta. Here we report it with a ratio, specifically what we refer to as a normalized ratio. Mm -hmm. Originally, mm -hmm. let's say 25 years ago, DRVV um, tests were resulted with what we commonly called a straight ratio, which was just the clotting time from the patient and the screening step divided by the confirmatory step. You had a ratio that you considered either negative or positive. As reagents have evolved and it has, as the methodologies have evolved, we now have, have um, the recommendation is now to use what we call this normalized ratio, mm -hmm. which incorporates mm -hmm. not just the patient screen or confirmatory result, but that also of a pooled normal plasma or some kind of a reference plasma result. So we have a screen ratio, which is the patient's value from the screening test divided by the normal or a pooled normal plasma. That ratio is then divided but with, but by what we call a confirmatory ratio, which is the complementary confirmatory result from the patient divided by the confirmed result of a normal plasma. So, and those two will develop, will then eventually get calculated into a normalized ratio, which again is the recommended way of doing it because this then can help account for any variations in reagents, which now have longer st onboard stabilities, mm -hmm. any instrumentation variations. Um, and so that way you can maintain reference ranges for long periods of time throughout your lot number. Okay, great. Yeah, and this has been a little bit of a controversial point in terms of this normalized ratio and is it the best way to go? And some papers show it has a benefit, some show it doesn't. But overall with the CAP survey, I know we've done these analyses before internally when we looked at CAP survey data and you do see a relationship of between the normalized you know, ratio results and the labs that got the right result out of the survey. So I, we we definitely can be sure that there's a benefit there. So Yeah, it really helps in standardization. As much mm -hmm. as we would like to do a straight ratio because it's easy, this normalized ratio really helps standardize the processes amongst, um, really across the board. Okay, great. Uh, this has been really illuminating conversation, Claudia, and I really appreciate your help with these details and try to you know, make this picture much more clear for everyone. You're very welcome, Paul. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's always nice okay. to talk coag with someone. I know. We don't have many people around. We got to stick together. Exactly. Uh, but we appreciate your help again. You're very welcome.